Hey everybody, I'm back on Facebook Live, so we're going to finish up this orthopedic lecture. So I'm going to work on lower extremities now. So really a lot of stuff I'm not going to go over because I've gone over the patterns and they are the same. So an orif of a wrist is the same as an orif of just about anything as far as those orders go for a uh, for you is the scrub tech. So I'm going to start at orif of a hip fracture on 934. If you're watching this, listening to this, I would look at your slideshow as you go along and study because it'll help you. If you are looking at the slideshow, the first thing I started with was your power drive system. So there's a link. Um, if you noticed, I put lots of videos this time on your slideshows because orthopedics is really hard to explain, especially without the instruments in my hands in person. So you really need to watch some videos if you haven't already, um, but it should just make it easier to understand as you're reading through. There's some things that are so detailed that you're not gonna completely understand yet, and they won't expect you to understand every detail of these surgeries when you go in. So as you're reading, think, what can I you know, pay attention to to remember as a scrub tech? So I'll try to point those things out to you, but remember, you're always gonna have a preference card. So you'll have a little cheat sheet for all of these cases. Okay, so orif of a hip. So definitely know your anatomy and study that. Uh, so don't forget what kind of joint it is, first of all. So ball and socket joint. Um, and know what articulates with what as you're studying all of this anatomy. So this one's really easy. Head of the femur articulates with that acetabulum. So you need to know this anatomy really well, just like the rest of your anatomy. So read over it in detail, know what articulates with what. Um, after you look over the anatomy, I want you to look at your second slide. So it shows hip fractures on page 935. There's so many different kinds of hip fractures. So where it says there's several categories of hip fractures, that's what this slide is for. So you'll see that there's multiple different ways to fix the fracture based on where it is. So like looking at the picture in your book, if you have a femoral neck fracture, that's gonna be uh, fixed totally differently than an intertrochanteric fracture. So it depends on where the break is, how they're gonna fix it. It doesn't go to a whole lot of detail on that in your book, so I added pictures for you so you don't have any confusion. Because I wouldn't want you to read this and think, this is how they fix a broken hip. It's not. It's this is how they are going to fix a very specific surgery. So I want you to flip over, page 936. So find where it says, the following discussion is a repair for intertrochanteric fractures. And it tells you the exact system they're going to use. So as you read over these procedures, they could do another hip fracture that's femoral neck and use a totally different system. It's still a roof of a hip fracture. So I know that can be confusing for students, so... Make sure as you're reading, if it says something specific like it does here, this is a intertrochanteric fracture, that's what it's writing about. So that means it's not like a femoral neck fracture. So don't get those confused as you read through. So make sure you highlight that part. There are some things that are going to be the same every time. So let's take a look at that. Uh, equipment, instruments, and supplies. So definitely need a fracture table and you need your C-arm and your power drills and your reamers and all the fun tools. Um, I didn't talk a lot about batteries yesterday and I should have. So batteries, they're all a little bit different. Uh, some, most of these batteries you're going to use on the power tools are going to be sterilized batteries. So that means they are blue wrapped and you can attach them to the bottom of your drill. Others, uh, you'll see that I posted it on the system eight. You'll see that the bottom of the screwdriver, the bottom down here, actually opens up. So what you have to do as the scrub tech is open up the end of that sterile holder for the battery, hold it out to your circulator, and then your circulator has to insert the battery. Then you close the top, make sure that stays locked so only your sterile item is being shown. So very different ways to get your batteries. So as you're looking through system eight, that's on your slideshow, Take a look at some other ones. There's Stryker, there's Synthes, there's Depew. Look at their battery system so you can see that some batteries are going to be sterile, some are going to be non-sterile, and there's a specific way to put those in. So all of these are type of things that you're going to be shown as an extern, so you're not going to have to guess and wonder what you're going to need. Uh, they can tell you whether you're going to have a sterile or non-sterile battery. 
but I wanted to take a second and talk about that. So uh, other things you're going to need, well, what's going to be more involved on these is the draping. I told you orthopedics, they do a lot of draping. Um, they tend to have a barrier drape on this one, so a lot of them are clear, uh, but it makes a nice barrier underneath all of these other drapes we already have. Mm, as, you're, as you're looking down, so under practical considerations, it talks about the C-arm. So on these cases, they'll have to do a lot of lateral x-rays. I talked about getting a C-armor drape before. So this is, uh, if you don't remember it, it's on my YouTube channel under draping. So basically the C-arm comes in, it goes over, here's our patient bed, it goes over the bed. If they need to swing underneath and take that lateral view, they're going to need some way to cover it up so we're not contaminating the field or even better, the C-armor drape. So make sure you remind yourself of what that is and the awesomeness of whoever invented that so we can prevent contaminations during our cases. Uh, you'll need lots of extra IV poles and of course they're gonna be on a fracture table. So when you're studying this stuff, think what's gonna be the same and what's gonna be different. So I pointed out what's different, it's a specific fracture and now you know what's the same, the positioning, the equipment you need in the room, the implants you need in the room, all of that stuff. So because this is ORIF, you're definitely going to have a rep in the room if possible. So they'll be helping you too with these implants. So I am gonna kind of go through this case a little bit at a time and I'll point out things that you need to know. So let's start at the beginning. So incision with a 10 blade. I told you with all of these orthopedic cases, unless it's a total joint, the incision is based on where the fracture is. So incision based on where the fracture is. They typically start these with a guide pin. So they're gonna put a guide pin into the femoral head to, um, to get this case started. So that's your number two in the book. That's really your number one. So look at number three after that. So you insert that guide pin into the femoral head it points out that you're going to be using the power drill to do this. So again, that's your system eight that I've posted on the slideshow. Um, procedural consideration down there is your reminder about the C-arm and the C-armor drape. After that, um, they're going to determine the reaming and tapping depth and the screw length. So for this one, I just want you, as you're looking at the pictures, to find the measuring device. So I actually put... Did I? Yes. I put a link so that you can see uh, how they're going to do this, but there's a big measuring stick that comes with it. It's one of the easiest instruments to grab out of the tray. It's easy to find. So they're going to use that measuring device, so find that one, and after that you're going to use what's called a triple reamer. The note for this one, the procedural consideration is Definitely true. It's happened to me. It's an extremely sharp instrument. So if this just grazes your glove, it will rip your glove. It's a triple reamer. So it's very sharp. Uh, when it happened to me, I was double gloved and the reamer went across my hand and it luckily only went through the first glove because otherwise the surgeon would have been very upset because they would have had, it would have been contaminated. So they would have had to wait for us to get another one. So be very careful with those. They're very sharp. So flip it over after they ream. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do next. So they talk about the triple reamer assembly on number six and the number seven where they're actually doing it. So the reamer's placed over the guide pin and drilled into the femoral head. So I want to explain why it's a triple reamer and it numbers them for you. So it's going to do three different things at the same time is why it's a triple reamer. So it's going to drill for that lag screw that they're going to put in. It's going to countersink, and it's going to ream for the plate barrel. So I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and you're used to seeing flat plates. So I put a picture in here for you. So under your slideshow that says, or if of a hip fracture, intertrochanteric fracture. I was very specific. That's what that barrel is going to look like. But we're basically fixating the hip specifically this way because it doesn't need to go through um, just the head of the femur like those femoral head fractures are and I'll point out that difference when I get there. Uh, so those are the three things that triple reamer is going to do. Um, after that they're going to use a calibrated tap um, then they're going to actually place that lag screw. Um, 
this all these assemblies are placed over the guide pins so it's very hard to explain without watching the video so you'll see why we have so many items that are cannulated and this is so we can put it over the guide pins so basically we want to not have to remove the guide pin um, it talks about in your book how if the guide pin does get removed which usually happens when they're pulling that reamer out. If the guide pin does get removed, they have to replace that before finishing the procedure. So they're gonna place that guide pin and then go back to doing what they're doing. They have to have that guide pin there in order to place this lag screw into the right place. Okay, so after that, um, we put in our lag screw, coupling screw, then the guide pin is removed. From there, the surgeon's gonna use an impactor and a mallet to really seed that plate onto the bone. So it was a very specific procedure, so look at that slide. It's page 936 to 938 also. Very cool procedure. Okay, total hip arthroplasty. So again, arthroplasty, total joint, you're gonna be wearing the hood uh, versus a arthroscopy where you're putting a scope in the joint. So again, pointing that out so you know these things are opposites. So for the total hip, so for the first page, wow, it's a lot of instruments, right? So I want you to pay attention to a few at the bottom. So I'm gonna point it out. It talks about it under your spacesuits. So basic orthopedic instruments, like I said before, uh, hip instruments if they have a hip tray, uh, Myridine retractors, those are my favorite. The surgeon I worked with said ding dong every time he wanted the Myridine <laughs> to be handed to them. So lots of nicknames for all these retractors, but you'll need lots of curettes, and these are big curettes and small curettes, so a variety of sizes. Osteotomes, gouges, Holman retractors are used constantly, and I'll point that out in the procedure, and the Charnley self-retaining retractor. So if you are studying retractors, Meyerding, Holman, Charnley, self-retaining retractor. Those are the three you need to focus on for hips. Um, these are big cases. Definitely need to have the implants in the room ready to go. As I said yesterday, um, if for some reason your rep isn't already in the room, typically your preference card uh, we'll have someone for you to contact on there. Uh, one of the places I worked at even had the phone number for the rep on there. So you can get a hold of them to make sure everything's ready to go before your case. Uh, also, I know I'm repeating yesterday, some places have their implants in-house in the OR. Others, the rep brings it in every day. So make sure you're communicating and figuring out what you need to do to prepare for these cases. Okay, if you flip it over, 940. There's a lot on this page because I'm gonna go through the case, I'm gonna point out one small thing instead. So look at anesthesia, lots of options. General anesthesia or epidural block or spinal block, continuous. So this means your patient could be awake. So I was shocked the first time that I did a total, total revision and realized that the patient was awake. I was shocked and nobody in the room even told me that because we're using very loud instruments, power drills, we're banging with a mallet onto a metal osteotome, it's loud in there. And you hear the patient go, hey, what are you guys doing? <laughs> They're nice and calm and don't feel a thing even though there's a complete ruckus going on around them. So just keep that in mind, your patient's awake, so watch what you say during these cases. You've got a good picture of the implant on 941, so you know what that's gonna look like. Um, as far as your setup, huge setup, so I put a picture of the implant on your first slide and what you're gonna look like in the hoods on your total hip arthroplasty, and then I put a couple of options for your setups. I put the specifics for the setup so that you can see that it's not just gonna be a total hip a lot. So there's different kinds, there's bipolar hips. Uh, some of these arthroplasties may not be total, so it'll say hemi-arthroplasty. A lot of different details in this, and I want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on understanding what they're doing in a total hip, and more importantly, the instrumentation and supplies that you're gonna to need to do this. Okay, so 942, as I was saying, there are usually going to be two Mayo setups for this one. Lots of instrumentation and power. So if you're looking at these pictures, don't get overwhelmed. Again, some of these trays with the implants, you're going to take one thing out of that tray and then bury it at the bottom. So you could have three or four trays stacked on top of each other. Um, another option for you is a double-decker back table. These are awesome. Uh, 
the drape is really specific. You know, they all have directions on it, so you don't have to worry about that. It'll direct you on how to open it correctly. But then you can have two shelves, so you could put all your implants on one level and then all your other instrumentation on the other level with your saws. So very cool if you can get a double-decker table. Uh, but you're definitely going to need two mayo stands for this one. I typically put like the basic instrumentation on one and then all my power on the other mayo stand. But it'll be up to you. It'll be scrub tech preference at that point. Okay, so I want to go through this case in a little bit of detail. I will say if you are the assistant on total hip, I told you I assisted a lot on totals, didn't get to do a lot of the first scrub roll. If I was on a hip and we had a very large patient, I had to really decide whether I needed to say something to the surgeon because they're going to have you pick up that hip, that leg and manipulate it for them. And sometimes they're going to have you dislocate the hip. If you physically can't do that because the patient is so much bigger than you, there's nothing wrong with saying something. You do not want to be into the position where they're asking you to do something and you physically can't do it. Uh, I've gotten close, uh, but I've never been in the position where I couldn't actually make it happen. You get that adrenaline rush and you just make it happen, but you'd never want to hurt yourself when trying to do these cases. So um, just think about what you're physically capable of. And of course, you know, we get free gym memberships. So you can always just go work out to get those muscles to be able to manipulate that hip well on these surgeries. Uh, I will also point out that you'll probably need a step if you're not the same height of the surgeon because you need to be at that same level to manipulate the leg for them so that they can see. So make sure you're prepared for the case. You got steps in the room or anything else that you need for you specifically. Okay, so 942 is where it starts. I'll just go ahead and say 10 blade. We're making our incision. Um, they're always going to have... Uh, Bovi to bovi down a little further into the fascia, but you're going to see that gluteus maximus really well on these procedures. After they get through that fascia, they're going to place that self-retaining Charnley retractor. So they typically have lots of different blades on it, so it's kind of similar to your Balfour retractor that you've seen in general surgery. Same idea, as in it has other blades to trade out. So if you have a patient that is, you know, needs a deeper uh, blade, then you can trade that out or a more superficial blade, you can trade that out. So after they place that self-retaining retractor, they're going to internally rotate the hip. After that, they're gonna find that sciatic nerve and identify it and protect it throughout the case. So if you don't know your anatomy, your uh, piriformis muscle is rubbing on your sciatic nerve. So if you have sciatic pain, you'll understand that because if your back is hunched over, that muscle is rubbing on that sciatic nerve. If you're sitting up straight, it's not rubbing on it as much. So hopefully you've studied your anatomy, but if not, make sure you review that, know where your piriformis muscle is um, in relationship to your sciatic nerve. So again, they're gonna protect that. Um, then you can go down to number 12. So here they're going to make a cut into the capsule. They're going to place a Steinman pin in the ilium, and you need to know that that is placed there. So this is superior to the acetabulum. So a little bit superior is where they're going to be placing those pins. They typically want a long knife handle to make that incision into the capsule. I've usually seen it on the number three long knife handle blade. It says in your book they could put it on a number seven also. So make sure you have a long knife handle for that one. After that, the hip joint is dislocated. It's flexed, abducted, and gently rotated. So this is the part you might get to do, um, which is really fun, actually. So you get to dislocate the hip and manipulate that so the surgeon can see inside that joint. Uh, so a reminder, and it has another the procedural consideration, this could be the surgeon doing it, the assistant, or the script tech. So manual traction is what they're going to call it. Looking at number 14 after that, um, they're going to mark on the femoral head with the bovi. Because of that, they are going to want that needle bovi tip usually on these cases. So basically, they're marking where that oscillating saw is going to go. After that, you'll see they're going to put in blunt Homan retractors. You need to know these retractors, and it's going to be placed around the femoral neck. This is all preparing to make the cut. So they're all just getting ready to use that saw. After they put those retractors in, you'll see we're ready for the oscillating saw. So don't forget, 
oscillating versus reciprocating. Uh, so we're using an oscillating saw to cut and remove the femoral head. Best part because the surgeon hands you a big head of the femur. Very awesome. You definitely want to hold on to that. I think John talked about that. Uh, they can use part of that bone. They could also send it as specimen. So you never want to think of tissue as trash. Always ask questions. Are we going to use this as a specimen, etc. Uh, so there you go under your procedural consideration. Script hex should immediately pass off the femoral, sorry, should not immediately pass off the femoral head in case it's used for bone grafting purposes. Uh, they usually have you measure this too to just kind of prepare for the femoral head implant going in so they can get an accurate measurement about what size it is. Okay, flip it over, page 944. So after that, they're going to expose the acetabulum. So again, that's up here. They're going to expose that acetabulum and get ready for reaming. So acetabular reamers, they're going to re ream the acetabulum, but I want you to know what they're removing when they do this. So they're going to remove the articular cartilage as they're reaming that acetabulum. I want you to look down, that was number 17. I want you to look down at number 18. So on 18, basically if they see any cysts or anything else in that joint cavity they want to get out, they're going to have curettes to remove those. So it talks about maybe seeing some cysts and removing those, but really I would have those curettes ready to go so you can remove anything that's out of the way. After that, we start the trial. So you start with the acetabulum first. So trial the acetabulum, and then I want you to go down to number 20. So then they're going to elevate that femoral neck using home end retractors again. Usually that bone is gonna be removed from like the medial side of the trochanter. This is basically to make room for the femoral reaming. So everything we're doing is kind of moving stuff out of the way so that we can ream, so that we can put the implant in. Uh, so yes, they're gonna make room for the femoral reamer. Look at your procedural consideration underneath number 20. So just a reminder, anytime a surgeon is using a ronger, you should have a clean lap in your hand. Every time they hold that instrument out to you, you're supposed to get that lap sponge and wipe that bone off of there. The idea is they can just keep biting bone and handing it out. The whole idea is you're saving them time. You're helping them. So you cleaning the bone off of that ronger sounds like a simple thing. It's very important and could be time consuming. And you're cutting time off the case by having that lap sponge ready to go and taking those pieces of bone. Okay, after that, they're gonna take pieces of bone out with our reamer. And they were, we already have those home and retractors in. That femoral neck is elevated. From there, now we can uh, get the T-handle intermedullary reamer. So it says that for a reason. So I am reamer is typically what it'll say. So it's gonna go through the medullary cavity. Um, they can also use what's called a box osteotome to remove part of that greater trochanter. Okay, so T-handle, I am reamer. And then look at your procedural consideration. So I said this yesterday, but it's like dilating. So you always want to start, unless the surgeon says otherwise, you always want to start with the smallest and work your way up. So same thing with reamers, just like dilating, smallest to largest. Okay, then they finally start reaming on page 945. So they finally start reaming the femur. And after that, they're going to use some rasps to rasp that bone. So... Number 22, they begin re using the reamers. Number 24, femoral rasps. And that procedural consideration you need to pay attention to because they typically call these rasp brooches. So there's different brooches that hook onto these rasp handles, I'll say, that allow them to do this manual rasping. Sometimes to get really into the bone, they're going to tap it with a mallet on the end to really get it in there too. So always have your mallet ready and available. So they're going to rasp a lot. When they get to that final rasp, um, they are going to clean out that cavity the best they can, but then they're ready to start trialing. So look at number 26. So trial neck and head is placed on the trial femoral implant. The hip is reduced. So after the hip, hip is reduced, the first thing they're going to do is check range of motion. So they're going to start moving that leg again. So again, if you're in the assistant position, that's you. You're moving that leg. Now the surgeon usually wants to feel it. They want to feel 
that it is has good range of motion everything's going well so they'll probably take that leg from you for a moment to check that range of motion but they can always have you manipulate the leg so be ready for that okay so now I want you to find where it says pulse lavage. They do actually say it on this total instead of a washout. So find where it says pulse lavage because you need to know this one has a brush tip on it. You definitely need the brush tip for this one because it needs to get all the way through that canal. So have clean, dry lap sponges ready to go. I even had some surgeons that would put clean uh, blue towels up there too to just kind of clean the area before putting in the real implants. So always pulse lavage with the brush tip on hips before the implant. And it goes over more detail of that on number 27. So look at number 29. Acetabular prosthesis is usually put in first. Um, this is where I'm not going to get into detail because John already talked about cement already. So make sure you're reading the procedural considerations about having a piece of cement in your hand and rolling it in your hand so you can see when it gets hot and you can communicate that to the surgeon so they know if they need to hurry up and get this implant in correctly. Okay, so acetabular prosthesis is placed first and then go all the way down to number 31. That femoral prosthesis is placed and they typically use a femoral impactor to really impact it and um, induce that prosthesis so it actually stays into position. Number 33, the end. The hip is reduced. They're going to check all the range of motion and all the positioning. The surgeon will definitely do the final checking of range of motion uh, to make sure everything's perfect before they leave. Number 34, they're just going to put in some hemovectorines. So just think about how involved this case is <laughs> and how many cuts we're making. There's lots of bleeding happening. So they're definitely going to need drains, specifically hemovectorines. Okay, that's your total hip. So again, I've got lots of pictures. On here um, I put the brand names on purpose so if you want to Google and look at Depew versus Synthes versus anybody else you can do that so look at all the different options on there and you can see different options for setups too so hopefully that gives you some ideas because you guys are pretty used to seeing pictures of major trays and basic instrumentation and orthopedics is just totally different but that's why it's so cool okay let's move on here, I grab my sticky notes, hold on. So page 949 and 948, femoral fractures. So for this, I've got two videos. I like femoral fractures. Uh, it's probably because I did a lot of these because I did a lot of ortho trauma. I didn't do a whole, a whole lot of orthopedics in general, but if you work 11 to 11, you're going to get uh, hip fractures come in all the time. So definitely know how to do a femur nailing. So... Here's what I want you to do. I need you to make some separate notes. You know how I love to do that. So in your book, it says repair of a femoral shaft gives the specific uh, femoral nail system. There's many different ways to do a femoral nailing. I want you, in your studying and research, I'm going to point out what in the book you need to know, but in addition to that, I need you to study what the difference between antegrade and retrograde. So basically, this is the different way they're going to approach this break. So go ahead and make your notes. Antegrade, they're going to come from the top. So this one, they're going to call piriformis entry. So I already told you, you need to know where your piriformis muscle is. So it's kind of near that greater trochanter. So it's right about there, rubbing on that sciatic nerve. So piriformis entry point, point for antegrade um, fixation. And then for retrograde fixation, they're going to come in at the bottom of the bone or underneath the bone. So this one you need to call intercondylar notch entry point. So you can see it at the bottom of 948. It's got the anatomy perfectly for you. That intercondylar notch that's your other option. So that's retrograde and antegrade nailing of a femur. On top of that, more notes for this page. So you have this big procedure, right? I told you these procedures in the book are very specific. So I want you to think uh, big in general overview of what we're doing. So I want you to make your note. This is an IM nailing of a femur. So intramedullary nailing of a femur. 
I'm doing that on purpose because if you're Googling, you're reading, you're researching exactly what's on the page, you're not getting the full picture. So there's different ways and different uh, companies to work with when it comes to nailing a femur. So in the picture, I've got a mayo stand set up for you, and I've got a picture of what the actual Synthes tray looks like. So that's the one I always used was Synthes. So make sure you're checking out those two instrument trays and what the Mayo setup looks like and watch the videos because I'm not going to go through that procedure step by step because it depends on the brand that you're using. So as far as your anatomy, definitely know all your femur anatomy. You should kind of know most of it from going over the total hip anyways. So uh, don't forget that uh, femur anatomy, but I want to look at... Page 949, on the right side of the page, the bullet point that talks about the exact type of nails that you're going to need. So there's lots of different options, and this is what I'm pointing out to you so you know it's not just what's in your book, and it's not just the YouTube uh, links that I put on your page. So there are flexible nails, interlocking nails, retrograde interlocking nails, intramedullary nails, and standard, they're calling them AO nails, but standard nails, that's the antigrade nails. So I want you to just know all your different options instead of getting bogged down with the details. As far as equipment, instruments, and supplies used for this procedure, definitely gonna need a fracture table. Um, you'll need a calibrated guide pin, cannulated drill bits to go with it, and a guide rod to go with it. So cannulated drill bits and cannulated um, Nails are going to go hand in hand. Go ahead and flip it over, actually. Like I said, I'm not going to go through this case step by step. So go ahead and watch the YouTube videos and watch how they are going to fix these femur fractures because these are very common, um, especially during the winter months. We slip and fall on the ice, especially patients with arthritis, things like that. They're going to fall down and break their... Um, break their hip or break their femur at some point. So make sure you know how to deal with those cases and what the setup's gonna look like. Go to page 952, arthroscopy of a torn meniscus. So knee scopes, you're gonna be doing a lot of these. So that's how they're gonna refer to it. First of all, our knee scopes, just like shoulder uh, arthroscopy, they're just gonna say shoulder scope. So as an extern, if you write down knee scope, or even if you wrote it out anatomically correctly, <laughs> uh, knee arthroscopy, even if you write that, you're not going to get uh, credit as an S1, because you didn't scrub one that case, because there's not a whole lot of instruments to hand out. So basically a knee scope, they could go in and just look. They don't, maybe there is no torn meniscus or ACL or any of these torn issues. Maybe there's no scar tissue in there. They're just going to go look, because the patient's going to the patient might be complaining of knee pain and they've done all the images they can so they're going to go in and look at it. So it could be diagnostic even. They go in and look at the knee. That's an S2 for you. That means you didn't pass a lot of instruments. We didn't actually do any repairs. We just looked. So that's going to be a big difference for you as an externship. So if they did knee arthroscopy with meniscus repair and you forgot to write with meniscus repair, you're not getting full credit for that case and that's a shame. So make sure you're writing down the entirety of the case so you're getting credit for everything that they're doing because they have to actually do a repair for you to get that Scrub Tech 1 credit. Um, I know you don't know what that means yet, but when you get into externship, most of your cases need to be Scrub 1. So you're in the Scrub 1 role, not the Scrub 2 role holding your tractors. So basically, if you don't do any repairs, we're going to call that a Scrub 2 role. So it's a quick, easy surgery. So make sure you're writing down all the details. So again, this is the knee scope. So arthroscopy of the knee, make sure you know your anatomy. I did put, um, yes, I did put some pictures of the anatomy on there for you and the anatomy of the meniscus so you can see the different types of tears. So know where your patella is, know that it's a sesamoid bone. Uh, know where your quadriceps femoris tendon is and your patellar tendon. So both of these you'll need to know for when we get to ACLs because that's where they can take your graphs from. So speaking of ACLs, go to same page, right side of the page. Know where your ACL is and where it attaches. So attaches to the posterior lateral condyle of the femur. 
So of course it attaches to your femur and your tibia. I want you to know the specific anatomy. So again, attached to the posterior lateral condyle of the femur and the notch in the midline of the tibia. So make sure you know that anatomy. Uh, know what the ACL does. So it basically prevents your knee from hyperextending um, and it limits that medial rotation of the femur. That's why if you ever talk to somebody who's torn their ACL, they will tell you that when they're walking, they still have the forward-backward movement, but if they try to turn to the side, their knee is just going to give out and lean to the side because there's nothing there holding it in. So they don't have that medial rotation anymore, pretty much. 953, there's good anatomy of the ligaments, really. So if you're studying ACL, you should be looking at that picture or the pictures I've posted for you. I also posted, again, your arthroscopy instruments, so you don't forget that you need camera, light cord, the scope, and the irrigation tubing. Looking at page 954, I go a little bit into the uh, meniscus anatomy. So know that there's a lateral and a medial meniscus. Uh, know what they actually are doing. So they're pads of cartilage padding while you're walking and running and jumping and everything you do um, in life. Know where it articulates. So the meniscus are that cartilage that rests on the articular surface of the tibia. So that's your anatomy that you need to know. Look at page 955. So I told you the basics, what you need for arthroscopy. I won't say that again. Look at your specific instruments. So a nerve hook, I want to point out that this is blunt. It's a nerve hook, but it just hooks around the meniscus so they can manipulate that tissue. So same thing with the probe. So nerve hook probe, those are both blunt. Switching sticks, scissors, punchers, arth arthroscopic biters. So basically you want little biters to fit into the trocar so we can take pieces of that meniscus or any other tissue out of that joint. Okay, I will go through this one also. So again, I'm going through a knee scope for you. I will kind of talk about the meniscus, but a knee scope could be anything. It could be a meniscus repair, it could be ACL repair, it could be diagnostic just looking. Um, it could be something else more. So make sure you're paying attention to what it says on the board and your preference card. So let me go through a knee scope with you. So you're gonna start with an 11 blade, as I've said before, make that poke hole incision. Um, usually lateral to that patellar tendon. We don't want to damage that. Uh, step two, we're going to put in those uh, irrigation cannulas for inflow. You're going to always have an inflow and an outflow on these cases. You need inflow and outflow so that joint isn't just constantly filling up with water. Uh, number four is where the next step is. They're going to make that stab incision um, for the sharp trocar so that you can put other instruments and the camera inside the knee. Number five, you'll see that the first scope that they're going to use is the 30 degree scope. So they'll usually have a 70 degree scope too, so they can have a different view, but they typically start with the 30 and you need to know that. Uh, number six, the surgeon inserts a spinal needle as a guide to make their incision. So I kind of told you that yesterday with the shoulders. They're going to use that spinal needle that's a long 18 gauge needle to uh, mark on that knee. Number eight, so this is the probe or the nerve hook that I was talking about that's very blunt to determine that the meniscus and the ACL are intact or whether it's torn. So basically they're gonna manipulate that tissue with the hook. So they're gonna hook it around that meniscus and pull on it and see how bad the damage is, if at all. Okay, look down at number 10. So they're gonna use that 18 gauge needle again to identify where they wanna make that fourth incision site if they make a fourth incision site. If they're doing a meniscal repair, they definitely will. Number 11, they'll get those arthroscopic graspers and scissors. So they're gonna take that tissue out of there. Flip it over, page 958. The cannula is positioned and each needle with the suture is inserted into the cannula through the meniscus. What I really want you to know is that you need to watch the video to see how they're going to feed this suture through and attach it. Because um, that's not easy to explain without the components in my hand. So I want you to know that this is going to form a loop over the tear. They're going to pull the suture outside of the body and secure it. So the suture is going to be secure so that the patient doesn't have any more pain and they don't have to come back to get another repair, of course. 
Look at number 16, procedural consideration. So these sutures are normally tied when the knee is extended. Um, while that knee is extended, you can prepare the closing sutures because basically they put those sutures in internally and then they're tying them down. So you know the next thing they're going to do is close up and you're going to be done with the case. So you need to prepare your suture for the end of the case. And that's it. I wanted to add for arthroscopies especially, they typically have their own special packs. I'd say, you know, knee scope, um, shoulder scope, etc. on there. Typically it has the dressings inside. You've learned for your CST exam to never open your dressings until the end of the case. This is a good example of when it's already going to be in the pack, so it's definitely going to be open. It's a good idea to either hide it under your basin, but you will see that a lot of scrub techs don't do that. Um, the 4x4s, you 100% should always hide those if it's on your field, because you do not want to get that mixed up with a Raytech, even on an orthopedic procedure. I don't want to get that mixed up with a Raytech. That's not a countable item. But the other dressings are really big and bulky, so that's why it comes in the pack, and you don't really have to worry about it getting inside a joint, especially on a knee or shoulder scope. So like big um, web rill or cotton padding, if that comes in there, or ace bandages, anything like that, that's okay. I don't want you to think, hey, get this off the field. It's a dressing so that I'm following the rules. Um, I hope you still have that in your mind so you get your CST questions correct. You are not supposed to open dressings um, until the procedure is over, or sorry, until the incision is closed, but this is an exception for that. The dressing sometimes will already be in the pack. So I just wanted to point that out for you. Let's move on to ACL repair. So page 959. I've got a lot on ACL repair. I won't get too much into the stuff that you need because it's the same as the meniscus repair, right? You need camera, light cord, arthroscope. So we're going to be doing this arthroscopically, um, but you will need extra items, lots of extra items. You're going to have a graft table to prepare this graft. So I started with, well, there's some knee anatomy. I started with just the basics, what you need, and a picture of the case. After that, I got two links to two different ACL repairs and you'll see them actually tying the suture outside and using the shavers and all the different items that you're going to have for these cases. The next slide I put the different options for the grafts. So for auto grafts basically it's going to be quad patellar tendon or your um, sorry patellar tendon or your quad tendon. So they can also do hamstring tendon but I put pictures on there for you so that you can see the different options. So let me get into the graphs first since I have that slide up. So look at page 960. Find where it talks about autographs. So autographs are used way more often um, than the other graphs because we'd like to use our own tissue. So used most often include patellar tendon graft, most frequently used, like I said, illotibial uh, band graft, I haven't seen that one as much, and semitendinosus tendon. But as I said, I put a picture on there of what they typically use. I always saw patellar tendon grafts, so that's what I'm used to seeing. So looking at page 961, so you'll see they're going to start with a diagnostic arthroscopy. So they're going to stick the scope in there and take a look at everything. Look at number two, letter C. So they're going to start this with a nachoplasty. So they're going to do this at the inter intercondylar notch. So I had some questions, um, worksheet questions, I believe, Heaven asked, uh, Heaven and Brittany asked. So for this section, it's telling you where they're going to attach the ACL. So where is it? The roof of the intercondylar notch is moved to prevent impingement of the ACL graft. So if you're wondering where they're going to actually seed that ACL graft into the bone, it's at the intercondylar notch. That's what it's looking for. So I just gave you a workbook question if you didn't already read it on the page. So you get one freebie at least. But that's where they're going to be actually attaching it. So they're going to start, like I said, with the nacho nachoplasty to widen that notch where they're going to attach the graft. So basically they're making room for the graft. Make a little hole for the graft. Look down at number three, letter B. So this is where it really gets started. So they're going to start with a guide pin inserted to the femoral site. Um, after that you can look at letter D. That guide pin is also going to be inserted into the uh, tibial 
on the tibial side. So anterior tibial incision into the intercondylar notch. So another reminder for where that ACL is going to be attached. So the rest of this, I'm not going to go through the details because it depends on where they harvest it from. So as I told you, I've seen patellar tendon harvest many of those because that's very common what the surgeon liked to do. But there's different options for your grafts and it goes through those on here. So you'll see one for quadriceps tendon graft and also allograft. So make sure you study that. You should definitely already know the names of your grafts. I know I went over that two weeks in a row, so I'll skip that part. Look at your picture on page 962. This should give you another answer to a question. So I can't remember who asked me this one. I got a lot of questions. Somebody asked me uh, what type of suture is going to be used for these ACL grafts. So yes, it says heavy, non-absorbable synthetic sutures. Ethabond is what I've o we've always used, and it even says in your book Ethabond. So make sure you know that's an example of heavy non-absorbable synthetic suture because we want that to be super secure. We want it to be strong. So Ethabon is a very strong uh, suture. If you don't remember, Ethabon comes in a bright orange package, but the suture is green. So it's, it's kind of unique and easy to pick out of the suture wall. It looks a little bit different. So Ethabon suture is usually going to be used. You can see how they're going to tie that on. They're tying it on to the end of either graft on the graft table as they prepare it and then they bring it up when it's ready to the knee and then they can place it in the knee from there. The suture is already attached on both ends and they can attach it from there how they want it and then check the range of motion at the end. So that's how we're going to suture the graft in. I want to point out another thing for you, so page 963 where it says femoral and tibial tunnels, number eight. So the two incision approach is established standard for ACL reconstruction. So it's telling you're typically always going to have two incisions on these. It tells you there is a one incision technique, but it makes it more complicated. So two incision is the most common is what it's pointing out to you. Okay, let's get to the graft. So we have the graft up at the knee, as I was saying, we're about to place it. So this graft, they usually mark it with the marker to notate where they want it to land. So if they want this piece on top and this piece on the bottom, they have to mark it that way so that it doesn't throw off their orientation when they get it inside the knee. So they're going to mark the graft after the sutures are already on it. The next thing you need to know as a scrub tech is to turn the inflow off. So it tells you letter B, number nine, turn the inflow off so the saline um, is off so it doesn't make that graft expand. So if that graft is expanding, you're, they're not getting a good idea of what it's really going to be like when it's not expanded. And they want to check that range of motion and make sure everything is correct and that's not going to be correct if that graft is filled with that saline. So make sure you turn your inflow off and then look at letter F down at the bottom. So under the arthroscope, they're going to confirm the placement of the graft and fully extend that knee. So again, they're going to check range of motion and then close up the knee. For the ACLs, yes. I didn't put a picture of the graft table on here because uh, I couldn't really find a good one that was completely set up properly how it should be. So look at the different options for ACL graft tables. Um, you can also look on Pinterest at some setups, but there wasn't a lot on that one when there's a million of total setups. So make sure you're looking at the graft table so you can see how they're going to prepare it on the back table before bringing it up. But again, it's part of a knee scope. Okay, after ACL, I start talking about amputations. So Amputations, uh, it's kind of morbid to say this, but I really enjoy doing amputations. It's sad for these patients that they're having this happen to them, but you're, you have to be a part of it. They need that leg off for whatever the reason is. So you're doing a necessity. Um, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the process as this necessity happens. Uh, as far as me saying I enjoy the process, it's just the tools. Uh, the tools are really amazing. So look at page 965. You'll see your options for amputations. So I never used the bone saw. Uh, most of the surgeons I worked with said, I don't know what that ancient thing is. I don't want to use that. They would use the giggly saw. So the giggly saw is letter B. You can see that it's just a wire and that it comes with two handles. It actually only pictured one handle in your book. It's got two handles. 
What I need you to know is this giggly saw is extremely sharp. So I put a video on your slideshow so you can see how easily that giggly saw can cut through a limb. So typically when I've seen it used, they still cut into the skin and bovied down, you know, ligated some vessels and then put that giggly saw around just the bone. Now when they do that, they wrap it around the bone, they go and the leg is cut. The video I posted is even cooler because they didn't cut into the skin or anything. They just put that giggly saw directly on the skin, couple back and forth, foot's gone. So that giggly saw is amazing. Because of that, you need to know how sharp it is. So just loading it up on the two handles, you could cut your glove and cause a contamination. So make sure you're paying attention to how sharp that one is because it doesn't look very sharp. Unlike letter A, that amputation knife. Uh, we do have one of these in the lab. Hopefully you've gotten to see it. We keep it in a safe place so that you guys can't get a hold of it because it is extremely sharp. This one typically comes in its own box so it won't just be laying in an ortho tray, something like that, because it's extremely sharp. This one is made to go through soft tissue also. So if they wanted to not cut through the tissue, they could just use it like a knife and cut that thing right off. So for amputations, I'm not gonna go over the difference between above the knee amputation and below the knee amputation because that is self-explanatory. We're cutting through obviously different bones and we're going to uh, wrap that end of that bone up a little differently. But basically every surgeon has their own techniques. Um, one of the surgeons I worked with had a specific technique that they would leave extra muscle at the end of their below the knee amputations. So they did this because the end of that tibia, as much as you rasp it off, is still kind of sharp. This extra muscle gave some padding over where they did the amputation. We have a lot of people that have multiple amputations, maybe for diabetes. If they fall on their stump, they hit those stitches, it opens it back up, it brings a chance for infection, and unfortunately they end up coming back for a higher amputation. So we want to do anything we can to pad that area. So that's one of many ways that surgeons have found to pad that area when they're doing amputations. So lots of different techniques for amputation. So watch, I put a video of below the knee, above the knee, and then I added in the foot amputation so you can see how the giggly saw is used. Um, typically your specimens, so think um, above the knee amputation. Your specimen's a leg, it's giant. There's no specimen cup for that. What we typically did was throw it into a red bag, unfortunately. It's still gonna go down to pathology, but you gotta think of a way to pass that off the field. Some people would maybe open another mayo or put it on their basin and kind of pass it off to the nurse, something like that. Um, I've also seen where the leg is big and heavy, so you don't really have a choice, so you're gonna have to pick that leg up and drop it into the red bag without contaminating yourself. So. Very interesting doing these amputations. Um, I only put one picture on the page for you so you can remind yourself that there's a lot of vascularity in the leg, so you're gonna need lots of clamps to clamp off these vessels, um, lots of silk ties to tie off these vessels also. So make sure you have lots of things to deal with the bleeding on these amputation cases. Okay, after amputations, I get into total knee arthroplasty. So because I went through the hip step by step, I'm not gonna go through this one step by step. I'm gonna point out something for you again. So 969, options for anesthesia, general anesthesia or regional or epidural block. So again, your patient could be awake. So a total knee was the first surgery I ever got to scrub in on. So that's pretty rare as a student. I'm not sure what the surgeon was thinking, but I asked lots of good questions. I was in the room for the first day. They told us we could either observe or scrub in. So I was told to observe until I was asked. So I observed and asked lots of questions until I was asked to scrub in. Scrubbed in immediately. Uh, they held me holder tractors and really they were just handing me pieces of bone because I'm sure they knew it's my first surgery and I was just in awe and amazed at what they were doing. So when they took those first big cuts of the femur, they handed me the pieces of bone and I was just probably with my jaw on the floor holding a piece of femur in my hand and it was a great moment for me because I really understood the anatomy instantly. I was holding a piece of bone in my hand and I thought, I get it. I can see cortical bone versus cancellous bone. I could see that that was spongy bone that I was holding. I could see all the holes inside of it. So I was 
immediately in love with orthopedic surgery on my first case doing total knees. So very cool case. Make sure you watch a video and read through all of this. I want to point out something on page 972. 972. So I think I said this under shoulders. It's very important. So I'm going to say it again. So you're going to test these saws before handing it to the surgeon. I've talked about this in the lab before, but if you're testing a saw blade, you of course want to treat it like a gun. You never want to point it at anybody. You want to point it away. Um, if I was setting up, I would always test all of my drills, saws, everything else to make sure the battery worked. I've always had extra batteries in the room too. But as I was testing those, I was facing the wall and nothing else and no one else because I don't want that to, what if it malfunctions and that blade were to fly off? So definitely always think safety and definitely always test things before you hand it over. I want you to think about what they're doing. Doing They're cutting pieces of the femur and the tibia off. So if that battery were to die halfway through, we're not making a good cut for that patient now. And that's your fault because you didn't check the battery. So I only grab batteries that are charged, ready to go, and again, always had extras in the room. So be prepared and be safe, most importantly. So test the saw blade, and then the second part I want to point out is where it says safety locking device should be kept in place until the surgeon is ready to use. So as I told you yesterday, typically they're going to want it ready to use. We want to do safety, but if they put their hand out, they're going to want it ready to use, especially on a total joint. So typically you're going to have it on safety, flip it over, and it, the second before you put that drill into their hand, drill or saw into their hand. So safety locking device should be on unless it's in use, period. Okay, so you can read through uh, the preparation for this, but honestly, I'm not going through this one because you can watch the video and your book has amazing pictures. So on page 978 through 981, they've got amazing pictures on your total knee. And again, I've put... Uh, videos on here for you. So you can see what instruments they're using and where the hardware is actually gonna go. On my second slide, I've got a picture of the hardware. So you can see that there's the femoral component that wraps around the femur, the tibial base plate that's flat, and then in the middle where that uh, insert is. So there's an insert in the center so your knee can move normally. And then of course on the back of that patella, there's gonna be an insert too. So. Just watch the video so you can see the entire process and look at the beautiful setups that are on here also. If you want pictures of more setups, I urge you to get on my Pinterest page. There's even more for you if you need more. On the second picture of the total knee setup. Yes, it's a setup, so total knee setup. So they've got all their implants laid out and the saws laid out. You'll see a big green foot holder so I talked about this on Monday with instrumentation. There was one picture and it said, this is a sterile item for positioning. So here it is, this is the leg holder. So it's got a contraption for your foot. It almost looks like a ski boot that you stick your foot into. Well, basically it has all these tracks on the bottom so they can lock the foot into a certain place throughout the case. So even if you're retracting, that leg is gonna be locked into place on that foot holder throughout the case. So look for that green foam around the foot holder so you can understand what that's doing for you during the case. John pointed out something very important on these cases. If you're retracting, you can cause damage if you're not following instructions. So this isn't one of those things where show me how hard you can pull. It's follow directions. If they say hold this, hold it. If they say toe in, toe in. If they want you to pull back, they're going to tell you. So just follow instructions. Don't do uh, things on your own. Make sure you're following our rules and our guidelines and just following instructions. Uh, so that's your total knee setup. Let's look at page 982. 982. So I don't have a slide for this one. This is your ankle and foot stuff is what it gets into. So your first case is triple arthrodesis on 982. Triple arthrodesis. So your book goes through the anatomy, which you absolutely need to go through, but it doesn't really say what they're actually doing in this case. That's kind of funny. So it gives you that anatomy, but what they're actually doing is fusing three different joints together. So I want you to make some separate notes as we do. So you know the three different joints that they're fusing together. So they're fusing in your ankle and your foot, subtalar, 
So hopefully you remember where your talus bone is. Subtalar joint. Calcaneocuboid. Calcaneocuboid. If you don't remember what your calcaneus is, that is your heel bone. So it's going to be attached to your cuboid. And then talonavicular. Talonavicular. So your talus is that bone that's right on top of the uh, calcaneus. So subtalar, calcaneocuboid, talonavicular. Those are the three joints that are being fused together. So let's look in your book first. So 983. So know what your calcaneus does. So it's your hip, or sorry, it's your heel. Your calcaneus aids in support, supporting the weight of your body and also the muscle attachments in your foot. So read through this anatomy and know your talus and your calcaneus very well. Um, know what they can do these triple arthrodesis cases for. So it can affect people with forefoot or hind foot, foot deformities. They can do it for other reasons too. So if those joints need to be fused together, they can fuse those together for other reasons, but typically for deformities. So because triple arthrodesis isn't the most common procedure, I put a different one on here for you at the end. So I put ankle fractures on the very end for you and there's a video for you to watch because ankle fractures are very common and just because they don't go over in your book doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it so I don't need to go through the process because you know drill depth screw or drill depth tap screw depending on what you're doing so make sure you watch that video on ankle fractures uh, this guy who I put on there, he does scrub tech tips. He doesn't have a whole lot of videos yet, but he's basically taking videos of his setups and explaining all of those details, which is amazing. I wish I had that when I was a scrub tech, somebody to break it down step by step, especially on orthopedic surgery. So definitely take advantage of what people are doing now, taking pictures of their setups and videos of their setups. So I hope that becomes the new norm because it's going to make you so much easier to learn this stuff. Okay, so now that I explained that one, go to page 986. So this one's Achilles tendon repair. So for your Achilles tendon, make sure you know your anatomy. I'm laughing because I saw somebody's Achilles tendon rupture before, and it was shocking to say the least. So when it says, it talks about in your book how basically people who don't work out very often, don't do a lot of activity, and then all of a sudden boom, do a lot of exercise and activity, maybe go play a sport for the first time in five years. These are typically the patients that have a ruptured Achilles tendon. So the one that I saw, unfortunately, was at the ballet studio. So this person probably hadn't been on point shoes in maybe five years, and they found some point shoes that fit them, and they thought, let me try this out. I'll jump up on point and do some jumps and leaps and turns and pop. And her Achilles tendon popped. So I'd never seen that before, but it's pretty crazy if you want to Google that or watch a YouTube video. Pretty crazy, but can be fixed. And of course, hers was fixed, and she got right back to normal life after that. Don't think she got back on those point shoes after that accident, but anyways. So your Achilles tendon repair. So make sure you know your anatomy. Um, know what your Achilles tendon connects to, first of all. So your gastrocnemius muscle, solus, and plantaris muscle. Well, basically it connects to your heel, right? So your calcaneus. So if you know that anatomy, you'll be good to go. Uh, know that it's the thickest and strongest tendon in the body. It's about six inches long too. Um, it's crazy when it ruptures because your leg looks a certain way with that Achilles tendon there. And when it's not there, it's, I don't, I can't even explain it. The leg looks totally different because that stretching isn't happening because you don't they feel like your Achilles tendon is six inches long, but when it's not there anymore, so basically it's like a rubber band that popped and now it's loose on either side. So the calf muscle looks completely different. So that gastrocnemius muscle is going to look completely different when the patient comes in. So looking at 987, I just want to point out the specialty instruments that you're going to need for this one. So equipment, instruments, and supplies. So flexible or rigid tendon pulling forceps. Also tendon stripper. So there's different ideas for this one, but the one that I always used is pictured in your book. So figure 21-40, that MyTech tendon pulling forceps. That's what we always use to 
find that tendon and pull it back down to where it should be before we tie it together. Um, also the tendon stripper, they could pull a tendon and strip that extra tissue off of there. So you gotta have those things available for this one. Um, I skipped over the pre-op stuff. I wanna look at pre-op and diagnostic tests only because this is a little different than normal orthopedic procedures. So normal ortho procedures, we're getting x-rays, right? Sometimes MRIs. This one, they have a specific test. So it's called the Thompson test. So it's a squeeze test. So they're gonna squeeze that calf muscle um, distally and basically see how the patient reacts. So the test is positive for tendon rupture if no flexion occurs when they squeeze on that leg. So they can test that very easily um, in the office so they can decide whether to schedule you for a Achilles tendon repair or not. For this one, pay attention to the positioning. You are in prone position. Very different from normal orthopedic surgeries. So I've got a picture of your Achilles tendon repair on there but uh, I wanted you to see really where they're sewing it up. So they're sewing that Achilles tendon back to where it should be. Uh, typically they're gonna use, I left this part out, typically they're going to use fiber wire. Now it says in your book, so if you read it, then you're gonna get it, but they're gonna use what's called fiber wire a lot on these orthopedic cases to do things like tendon repairs. So you definitely need to be familiar with fiber wire and what it is. So after your Achilles tendon, we get to last but not least, bunionectomy. So bunionectomy is very common. Um, right before I got on, I saw Kelly's question about bunionectomy. So she asked, I watched the video, they put a screw in. Why would they put a screw in? So if you look at the defect on my slideshow, you'll see that they're going to remove a big piece of bone because they're sawing off such a big piece of bone. It's basically so your bunions here, right? They sawed off this piece of bone but it's still not straight yet. They wanna make it straight. So they're gonna bring that uh, bone over and try to stick a screw through it just so it stays there that whole time. So basically the screw can be placed to realign the bone. So the screw is going to hold this repair into place. So that's why they can put a screw in sometimes. Honestly, I didn't go too much into your bunionectomy because there's a lot of different ways to do it. So there's lots of new, um, there's lots of new materials that are out. So I've seen where they put a pin in instead of a screw. It's a very small pin specifically for bunionectomy. So they're coming out with new things every day. There are different ways to repair it. As you're studying, I want you to study the terms hollux and vulgus. I'm not going to go over that. You should already know. And bony exotosis. I have told you exotosis. They're talking about a bone spur. So don't forget that anatomy. Um, it says bunions are very common and women who wear high heels and things like that. That's very true. Uh, there's lots of other people who get bunions too for different reasons, but it's typically from your shoes or wearing on your feet for years and years. So if you have flat feet, um, pronation, supination issues, and on top of that, you're, you're wearing uncomfortable shoes, you're going to have bunion issues. For your studying, make sure you know the various types of it says the various types of surgical procedures. It's different surgical techniques to fix the bunionectomy. So it goes through some of them, Aiken, Chevron. We always use the McBride technique, but there's different techniques on how to fix this bunionectomy. But what they're always going to do is use a bone saw to saw off that extra bone that is sticking out um, laterally, causing the patient pain. So that's why it's usually rubbing on their shoe, and that's why they're having pain. So they're going to cut a ligament and then they're going to cut a big uh, piece of bone off and remove any tissue necessary. Um, typically on these you're holding retractors while they're sawing. So you'll see in my picture they actually have, you'll see a green cap that's on a pin. So they did put a pin in this one instead of a screw when they put a nice little pin cap on it and now they're sawing off the bone so it's not sticking out the side of the foot and causing them pain. So when that bump is removed that's your bunionectomy. So that's your last case, and remember the last slide I put on here was an ankle fracture so that you can see how they do that one. So that's, I, in my opinion, the best video that's on here because I never had the opportunity to have a scrub tech have their whole setup laid out and then go through each individual instrument and why it's there and what they're going to use it for. So that's a fantastic resource. Make sure you use that. Okay, I'm finally done with orthopedic surgery. I can't believe it. It's a big chapter. 
Uh, I know it's a lot of stuff. Like I said, most of this you're going to learn hands-on when you're doing it. So think about what you need to know for externship after this test. So study everything for the test, and then when you're done, think drill depth tap screw over and over again and anything else that you need to have for these cases. So study the basics when you're preparing for externship. Um, I want to end with thanking Colton and John for talking to you guys about orthopedic surgery. They both had lots of experience in specific orthopedic surgery. So John with total joints and Colton, it sounds like, did a lot of orthopedic surgery in general, but because of his shoulder, he knows a lot about shoulder surgery. So he even went through the anatomy like I don't do, so he went above and beyond for you guys. So I hope you appreciate that and to get another view of these surgeries. Um, as far as participation, remember you have to comment or something, anything. It doesn't have to be a question, so I think Sarah put great lecture because she didn't want to ask a question, I'm sure. That's fantastic. That means I know you watched it, you're paying attention to what's going on, and you know I'm here for you if you do have a question. So make sure you comment on anything from this week, um, or you can post something, share a picture, anything you want. Uh, I would love to see some more setups. I saw some pictures of some setups at home. I know it's sad we're not in the lab. Trust me, I'm sad. I was so proud. I was so happy that we were <laughs> ready to go. We were early. We were ahead of the game, but that's okay. I'm prepared to have you guys review over some stuff when we get back into the lab. For you, you really need to mentally go over the stuff in your head. So I know ortho is a big chapter. So what I want you guys to do, what I hope that you do, is focus on orthopedic surgery until you take this test on Thursday. After you take your test, think about lab for a little bit. I posted the PDF so you can see everything you're tested over for mock surgery. If you sit there and go through it in your head, I think it's going to make a big difference. If you go over a PDF I posted a long time ago over counts, it'll go over what to do if that count is wrong when you're starting the... <laughs> I got distracted by Gabriella's <laughs> comment. She said, great lecture. That counts. Thanks. <laughs> Go over the counting like what, what happens if you have four laps and the patient's in the room versus them not being in the room. I know we went over that stuff in lab, but it's been a while and you're not doing it hands-on. So because you can't do the hands-on stuff, go through it mentally. Go through mock surgery in your head step by step. Think about stuff like that. There's big components of it that is mental, like knowing what to do during a contamination, knowing what to do if the count's incorrect. A lot of it is mental. So if you get all of that in your head now and it's second nature, all we're going to have to review is the physical stuff. The remembering to keep your hands up, remembering to not turn your back to the table, that stuff that became second nature to you. Now, I know you guys are great, so I'm kind of hoping you're going to go in there and it'll be second nature. It'll come right back to you. But if it doesn't, don't worry. We're here to help you. So I don't want you to stress about not being in the lab. I want you to take advantage of what you have. What you have is that PDF worksheet to go over mock surgery in your head and every skill in your head. The other thing I hope you have is a suture uh, sorry, a suture setup or something to practice with instruments at home. So I know I posted when we first went online different options like from Ethicon for suture um, kits so that you can practice loading suture and all that stuff so you don't forget how to do it. So I really urge you to do that if you can. Um, we found some cheaper versions too. If you really need that and you don't have one, send me a message. I'll help you get one because I really want you guys to be practicing at home and not lose your skills. Um, if you do not want to get one of those, like I said, practice with anything. Pass the scissors, pass the steak knife, pass your tweezers, pass anything correctly. Pass side by side, pass across. Anything you can do to not lose your skills because I want to go back into that lab running. So we're going to start with a little review, but... Hopefully you'll have all this mentally in your head. So we're not going over details like that. We're going over the physical part of the lab. That's what I would like to do. One last comment on my sticky note. <laughs> so I just want you guys to know how awesome you have it. So Matt's class right now, they're on nutrition. So hopefully you remember during nutrition, you did all these different presentations on pathologies. And I know you guys love doing presentations in front of people. 
Well, these awesome students are doing their presentations on Facebook and posting it on their private page. So all of the instructors are watching their individual videos from their home. So you guys didn't have to do that at least. So <laughs> look on the positive side. And if we're online too much longer, I'll come up with some assignment for you to send me a video. So <laughs> hopefully it won't be too much longer because I can't just keep talking to myself. I need you guys to talk to me too. So again, last chance, make sure you participate, comment in some way underneath one of the lectures or send me a message if you're having issues with anything. I'm here to help you. So if you have any questions, let me know. Talk to you soon. Bye.